Welcome to Ask a Puppy Trainer Show. This is where we answer all of your questions about puppyhood. I'm Bethany. And I'm Sparky from The Puppy Academy. We're excited you're here. And now, let's get to the show. Guys, welcome. Welcome to Ask a Puppy Trainer Show episode 164. My name is Sparky. We do not have Bethany today, so you know, the kids come out to play. This is Whiskey. Whiskey's very happy to be here. Got a little Pokeball on the collar. It's actually a bell. It's very cute. We like Whiskey a lot. He's our buddy. All right, let's get into some questions. So if anyone has watched when just I'm doing it, they kind of know I go into rapid fire mode until someone yells at me to slow down. Hopefully one of these two does it to slow me down, but we'll see what happens. Uh, anyone... What happened? Yeah. Hey, 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 I just talked to you up, dude. You gotta chill. I know, you're supposed to chill out. So, anyone that wants to submit questions, we have a lot of different ways of doing it. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, email, there's a lot of different ways. But if I do read your question, and you're on the live, you're, you're here, we always have someone watching the screens. I'd love to answer any follow-up questions you guys have, so please, ask a follow-up, and I'll try to get to you guys as soon as possible. I love the back and forth, it just feels more personable. So we'll try it as much as we can. Okay, I'm gonna start with this one because this is just rad. We have Deline from South Africa. Very cool. I have a two-month-old Dotson puppy and her name is Aspen. I'd like to know, I'd like to know, do I need to keep her in the playpen for potty training or do I need to get the crate because she does not have a crate? Um, I'm gonna start with that one. You can do potty training in a playpen. It's just significantly harder because when you're doing potty training, and guys, if anyone's wondering, I'm starting to hold my puppy a little bit closer because she's a little bit wiggly. I'm also going to try to cover that bell. Excuse me. He's a little bit wiggly. I'm covering the bell, holding her right between, or holding him right between the chest. He's just so sweet though. I want to call him a girl because he's so dang sweet. Usually boys are more crazy trying to jump on my face, but holding right between the chest just to kind of help him settle more. I might even bring in my hand above the neck and kind of do like a deep pressure massage. It's hard for you to see. I feel like a deep pressure massage, kneading into the neck like that. It's really helping him settle a little bit quicker. He's watching dogs coming in now the building. All right, back to the question. That's my ADHD talking right there. Unmedicated ADHD. All right. Uh, in the playpen versus the crate, do we need a crate? We don't have one yet. The playpen, you can crate train a dog. However, it's just significantly harder. The hardest part about the playpen is that there's a lot more room for them to walk around. When they're in the crate, it's only supposed to be about as big as their body. So if I had whiskey, I'm only looking for about two inches past his head, two inches behind his head, enough space for him to do a full circle and lay down. And if he stands in the crate with his head up normally, he's not banging his head on top of the crate, which means it's not gonna do any bad stuff to his neck. We want him to be comfortable in there. We want to eventually have him build confidence in there. All that happens from one making it a comfort zone. Uh, so yes, I do, I do approve of crate over playpen. Playpen, it can be done. It's just much, much harder and you have to take them out 10 times more often. And the playpen has to be in the same room as you guys. It can't be in a different room because they have to be monitored. Collars can get caught on the top of the playpen. Dogs suffocate from there. So you got to make sure that they're safe in there. Crate is just the easiest method. Second part. Then my second question is if, she, if she is outside for potty, she comes in later, plays around in the house and also has potty in the house. So then, so then if she comes in the house, uh, so they're taking the puppy outside, they go potty, they come back inside, they run around, they're having potty accidents inside the house. It sounds like you're doing what I asked though. You're taking her out, you're giving her a potty after the crate time, the minute she comes out of crate on leash outside for potty. If you're taking off your leash when they come back inside, that will lead to some potty accidents because a lot of time when a dog has already done some running around outside, comes in, does more exercise, more running, more training, more playtime. It's movement that creates more of the need to go potty. So if your puppy's coming in and even playing for 10 minutes, if you let them off the leash or you just let them free roam, they're probably going to have an accident. Pick them back up, put them on leash or keep them on leash and never take it off and then take them back outside. Give a second opportunity for potty after play. If they come inside, they're doing another hour before going into the crate, you might even need to give one more opportunity for potty outside. Because if I read this right, two month old, eight weeks guys, this is not our 12 or 16 week old puppy. This is a dog who probably needs to pee every hour on the hour in order not to have potty accidents. That's a little itty bitty bladder. It's like the size of my thumbnail. They can't drink that much water. And that brings me to my final point. How much water are we getting? We don't restrict water. 
We limit and give opportunities for drinking water. If a bowl of water is on the ground all day long, even for 90 degree weather, your puppy is going to go back to that bowl significantly more than they actually need to, which means they're going to get 10 times more potty accents because they have full access to water. That doesn't mean we eliminate it. We give it to them in waves. I've taken my puppy out of the crate. I don't give water yet because they still have bl- they still have water in them that they've turned into urine that they need to go express outside. I take them outside. They give me a potty. I bring them inside to do some walk, play, training. I give them movement. They're getting tired throughout that. They're panting more and more. I'll give a little bit of water at the end of that free time window. And if you want the exact measurement, anyone here knows I'm all about the numbers. It's a half cup of water for every 30 pounds of body weight every two to three hours. I'm not going to do the math for you guys. If your dog weighs 15 pounds, it's obviously going to be half of a half cup. So play with those measurements. And a lot of people will say, well, my puppy drinks a ton of water when they do drink water. I don't think that will be enough. Try the half cup if they're at that weight. Give them 10 minutes in the crate. Watch them. If by the end of that 10 minutes, they're not, (laughs) and they're just watching you, sadly, that's them just not wanting to be in the crate, but they may not necessarily need more water. If they are still panting, give another quarter cup, half the amount. 10 minutes later, still panting, give another quarter cup. Now they're not panting anymore. Okay, they needed more water. Due to that level of exercise and activity, They need more water because of that. If you're doing less activity, less exercise, more training, but you have salty treats, you may need more water for that. Play around with it, guys. I can't give you an exact measurement because every dog is different. My dog drinks water three times a day. That's it. She's 12. She pants all day long. She chooses not to drink water. That's just her style. That's how she does it. We can't force them to drink it. We just provide the opportunities for them to. All right, perfect. Kimberly, were you pointing to screens? Yeah, you got a live question. Instagram or TikTok? Instagram. Scroll up for me, please. I don't have Bethany's phone, guys, so I can't answer it in the same way. Hello, I have an 11-week-old male... No, get off the mic. I have an 11-week-old male Staffy. I have tried doing the bump when he's nipping, biting, or jumping on me, but... When do I, when I do it, he will sometimes continue bark, jump towards me, at me. Okay. Oh, there's more. Shoot. All right. Continued. I followed what you guys said in the last live about being continuous with bumps and body language. However, he continues. All right. Um, bumps and all that are only one step of it. I also have leash for the second half of it. If I'm going to, yeah, we're, we're just carrying them along now. Got my leash. Boom. Shoot, my mic's hanging. Sorry, guys. If it pulls out from under my shirt, I'll fix it. I have my leash in one hand. I have my body in front of my dog. My dog goes to jump on me. I'm not just doing a little knee bump and stepping in. By the way, a staffy is a very persistent dog. The knee bumps might have to be a little bit more firm. I'm not saying hard because we're not trying to Muay Thai our dog in the head. It's actually more of just a quick bump, step in, grab the leash. I'm going to back up. Grab the leash. Go up and out with your arm. Normally, I'd do two hands with the staffy because they're a really strong breed. But here's the key factor. Their front two feet can't be hanging off the ground. That's too much pressure, guys. That's choking them. It's got to be only enough pressure to go up and out with a small step in, eating up some of their space, getting them to back up a step. And most times when they back up, they put themselves in a sit. Once you get that sit, Pause for one more second. Don't just release really quickly because they're going to jump because it's still energy to release that quickly. No. Hold, pause. Hold, pause. Dog backs off. Dog sits. Good. Slow release. The minute you release that pressure, they're going to do it again. They're going to jump on you again. Pressure up, hold. Weight them out. Straight elbow if they're pawing at your at your chest. Sits again. Good. Slow release. You might need to do it three or four times in a row just to get your dog to de-escalate to a certain level. And once you get that level of de-escalation, then you got to do something. Then it's your redirection. Everything that we do, guys, is redirection reward or for a bad thing, correction redirection reward. Correction comes in a lot of forms. It doesn't have to be a leash tug. It doesn't have to be a hard knee bump. It could just be a no and a slight leash pressure up. The redirection part after that is then Come, play, sit down. 
come 25 times with food, guys. If you have a young puppy, you should have food on your hip at all times. That's your leverage. That's your control. So you're not just jerking your dog all around. You're using food to lessen some of that pressure. So then when you release your tension, dog doesn't jump. You got about a two second window before your dog jumps again. Capitalize on it. Come, good treat. Come, good treat. Fast pace. Come, 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 come. And then come sit. Good treat. Break. Final treat. Come sit. Come play sit down. Everything is slower pace. You do fast pace to use some of that bigger energy they have. What's controlling their like brain right now is that impulsiveness. Use up some of that and then slow them down and help them attain a calmer state of mind through your training. Guys, you just became a dog trainer when you do this because you're not just training the body to do commands for tricks. You're training the brain to learn how to be calm. That's what dog trainers do. Now you're a dog trainer. Good job. All right. Shit, I had a lot of questions. Kimberly, why'd you let me spend 10 minutes on those first two? Okay, this is, oh, I like this one. Are you gonna hang out, Whiskey? I'm gonna give you some freedom. Just hang out for me, yeah? I need two hands. Or chew the paper, that works too for me. All right, this is from off of one of our videos, the right way to teach your puppy, no. So one person asks, any tips on the same training but with a deaf and blind puppy? Is the dog deaf and blind? Oh my gosh. I don't know, I gotta be honest. <laughs> You done with me? Give me five more minutes and then you can go. No, no, no. Kimberly, I got five more minutes with whiskey. He's my buddy. Uh, deaf and blind dog. I gotta be honest. You gotta be able to give cues and you're gonna have to use sniff. Like you're gonna have to use the nose and you're gonna have to use, uh, sensitivity of like body. Um, I mean, we never recommend e-collar on this program, but e-collar is the only way of you communicating with your dog. Remember, there's a lot of different types of e-collars. There's literally a small dog vibration only collar that has different levels of vibration. So you could do like a food lure with food to the nose while you're holding the button and then basically lifting up the treat to get the sit. So they start learning different taps on the e-collar, different levels of holding. I mean, that's such an advanced program though. Don't do it yourself. That's all I'm gonna say. Hire a professional dog trainer that knows e-collar training and is willing to work with you. That's not gonna be their normal style of training. It's not gonna be a correction program. It's gonna be all redirection and helping the dog understand different cues. It's probably gonna be double clicks, triple clicks, single clicks, holds, and associating a different command with each one of those. Oh my gosh, I've never seen a blind and deaf dog. I've never seen that. It's like a new one for me. I can't tell if I'm being trolled. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, you're, you're going e-collar route in some way, but you need to find a trainer to help you do that. Cause I'm willing to bet you there's going to be a lot of frustration in the beginning. Are you eating my mic? I knew you were eating it. Get out. Okay. Whiskey's done. The mic, the mic eating is usually my cue for that. Bye whiskey. You go through it. Ricky, can you still hear it clearly? Did he bite through my mic? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I don't know what else he is on that one. E-collar is probably my go-to for it. All right. We have a four-month-old cockapoo. Thank you for age and breed. It does help. Who we didn't put a leash on around the house to begin with when we got him at eight weeks. And now he's allowed out and we want to do leash walking training. But every time we put the leash on inside, he chews it and throws himself on the floor. Any tips you could offer? Yeah, start an indoor training program. He has to drag his leash around from now on. Anytime he comes out of the crate, he's inside the house, he has a drag leash on. Harness, drag leash. If harness creates more frustration because he's feeling wrapped up, you can put it on flat collar for a cockapoo. You gotta make sure he's not getting caught on anything. Uh, some dogs actually feel less frustration if the leash is on the flat collar than the harness because the harness is very restricting to the body as well as having a leash on, which is already pissing them off. So just play around with a couple different things. When my dog can start dragging around the leash and follow food that I'm dropping on the ground in like three foot increments, and he can start tracking that food, then I wanna start with just basic come. Food to nose, say their name, come, walk backwards, good treat. Couple of those routines, come to a sit, 
place, place to a break, things like that. Uh, our online school has all these routines if you guys want to find them all in one place. Um, but yeah, I would just start incremental steps. I'm not even trying to walk my dog outside on a leash and harness until I can get a beautiful let's go work inside my house. Let's go work is pressure on. I want something from you. Pressure off. You did the right thing. I walk forward. My dog pulls. I step backwards and slightly to the side. Let's go. Dog fights. Anchors. I wait. Gradually adding a little bit of pressure, but having food also waiting by my ankle or my knee, depending on how tall my dog is. The minute my dog sees the food, gives in to the pressure to come get the food, physically give in on the pressure as well. You need to be a double part. They give in a little, you give in a lot, and you motivate food, 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 food. Don't actually say food, food, food. That's me exaggerating. You show them the food, they come to check in with the food, and then you go the opposite way. You're building them up though, but you gotta get some serious basic obedience in your house on leash, and then you gotta start working on your let's go work up and down your hallway in your living room. Heel up and down your hallway in your living room. Then backyard, side like side yard or like sidewalkway, driveway, garage, and then eventually the sidewalk in front of your house or even the front yard. It's a gradual progression. But yeah, if you're, how old's the dog? Four months old? Yeah, I mean, two months of him just kind of not having a leash on. I, I know dogs that don't wear a leash for three years and then the owner tries to go back to it. They're gonna struggle. You don't have that much of a struggle. You just got a stubborn, spoiled pup. They just need to be shown that they do have to work for certain things, but you are willing to wait them out. You have to be the epitome of patience because they're not. So you have to help them that way. Oh, and I always got to think from the side of Bethany. And you know, Bethany is going to say, how much exercise are they getting as well? Are they doing constructive, efficient play? Are they doing fetch and drop on a leash? Are they doing tug and drop? on a leash? Are you doing play where your kids chase them around the backyard? Because that's going to make them never want to come. These are also aspects that I know for a fact Bethany would mention, which is make sure your dog is physically stimulated as well as mentally, but the games that you are playing with your dog aren't the ones that are going to affect your training. Never chase your puppy, guys. That's how you teach your dog to never come when called. You say come, they say go. So these are small things, but focus on the body and the brain in tandem, which is going to help your training as well. All right. And this is from Carrie Eccles. This is from someone that we gave advice to a couple weeks ago and they've implemented it. And now it looks like they're running into a couple new issues. We all know I don't paraphrase. So get ready for the whole thing. Hi, thank you guys so much for answering my questions on your live a few weeks ago. That really helped and we moved her out of our room at, that night. I have another question if you don't mind. I work from home and during the day we do scheduled naps in the crate and then we do playtime for about an hour to an hour and a half before she goes back down into her crate. That has worked very well. We have a pretty great schedule. I'm running into having anxiety about, having anxiety about leaving throughout the day or at night Anything scheduled longer than her usual naps, which are about two hours, and leaving her in the crate for longer than what she's normally in the crate for. I'll end up calling someone to come and sit at the house to let her up when she's awake. How do I get over this? Will she be okay for longer than that? I don't want to ruin any sort of schedule that we've established. Try it out. Just try it when you're home, though. Don't do it when you leave so your person comes back to like three ounces of pee in the crate. Try two and a half hours today while you're working, and you hit the two-hour mark. Your dog knows when she gets to come out. She's she's acclimated to it. Plus, Dawson's don't like being in the crate anyway. So she's probably going to wake up at the two-hour mark. Let her bark it out for 15, 20 minutes. But there's a caveat to that. All of you people out there, they're like, barking out is so bad for their mental well-being. It's not bad for their mental well-being. It's just hard for our mental well-being to listen to it. Most dogs will eventually get over it unless they actually have legitimate crate anxiety. That's not separation anxiety, guys. That is a literal fear in a need to be out of the crate. There's other ways to work them through that. That's not what we're talking about. Dotsons have separation anxiety to the owners. Wants to be next to owner and mom a lot sooner. What I would try instead is I'd push that extra 15 to 20 minutes and see what kind of barking you get. Is it the frustrated bark? The the I'm pissed off, let me out like the chicken bark? Is it a loud bark? That turns into a scream bark. 
or it's a really high pitch one. Most of the time, that's our puppy changing their bark because they've gone from, I want to be let out to, I got to pee and it's going to happen now no matter what happens. If you don't let me out, it's happening right here in this crate. If I get that higher pitch bark, I'm going to go address that. I'm going to walk in there, check on my puppy. Most times they're going to stop barking the minute I get up there. And if they're like circling in the crate and it looks maniacal, that dog's got to pee. Take him out, get him outside for a potty, put them in there for the last 15 minutes. And that is telling you right there, guys, your dog can't hold it for more than two hours or two hours and 15 minutes. But it will, it will happen eventually. What was our age? Do I have an age? 16 weeks. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, two hours for a 16 week old dog is pretty standard. I mean, Dotsons, you're going to get a little bit less than other people get with their dogs. Medium breed dogs, large breed dogs, they can hold it probably double that at the same age because their body's bigger. It holds more urine. Even though, yes, they drink more water, it still holds it better. Uh, 16 week old Dotson, I would say you should be able to get about Two and a half to three hours, no problem. I don't think you're going to run into a problem two hours and 15 minutes in or even two and a half hours in. I think you're going to hit a wall when you get to about three to three and a half hours. And that's definitely when I'd start calling someone over to help you out. Uh, but try it out when you're home. When you get off this call, if you're listening, put your dog in the crate for two and a half hours. But now, are you managing your water intake? Remember, guys, we didn't say preventing water intake. We're not holding it. We're not holding it back from them. We're managing the water intake. Are we giving a bowl that's this big with that much water in it? Guess what? They're going to pee after two hours in the crate because they can't hold it longer. They're drinking too much water. So manage your water intake. Maybe cut it off like uh, 30 minutes before they go in the crate, maybe even an hour before they go back to the crate and give them one more potty opportunity before they go in. You should be able to get them a little bit longer in those two hours and every week push it by 15 to 30 minutes. That's what I try. Okay. Is she on? I love it. I love when you guys look, watch. Makes it so much more fun. Was there any follow-ups for her? That's about exactly what we're getting. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Uh, the two-hour mark or the two hours and 15 or two hours and 30? Answer me. Answer me, Kay. Answer me, Carrie. Are you getting two hours and 30 minutes or two hours and 15? Or are you just getting the two and then you're getting screen barking after the two? <laughs> Did she answer? No, not yet. I'll come back to it. Just tell me if she answers. No pressure. All right. Next one is. I think it's. I think it's. Okay, that's good. If you're almost getting three, then shoot for two and a half hours pretty consistently, and then work from two to thirty to two forty-five, two forty-five to three. Just play around with it. But no, thank you for answering. It makes me very happy. All right, next one is from Hearts. I want to increase crate time because mine won't go in the crate unless he's already sleeping and he gets guided in maybe 30 minutes max. Um, what is stopping him from, me, from staying in there longer? If it's barking, if it's crying, then you can push him significantly farther than that. If it's him peeing in there, we have a different problem. Let me just reread this really quick. I want to increase crate time because mine won't go in the crate unless he's already sleeping. And get and gets guided in and maybe 30 minutes max. So he's already in a settled state before he goes in there. So your biggest issue, I'm, I'm trying to read between the lines a little bit, guys. The biggest issue is not the fact that she will only go in the he, she? Okay, he. The biggest issue is not that he won't sleep longer in the crate. It's the fact that he will only do it if he's already sleeping outside the crate. So he has to be in a state of mind to maintain that. But now, how do we achieve a better state of mind? Um, you need to get on a tighter schedule. And that doesn't mean be in the crate for an hour and a half, come out for 30 minutes, go back to the crate. No, I mean, yes, you should do that too, but I don't really care about that right now. What I care about is what you're doing when your puppy's out of the crate. Are you giving infinite free time to just let them roam and play and jump and sleep on the couch and get cuddles? You're not setting your pup up for success. And I, I'm putting finger at you. I don't actually know. I'm just making guesses, educated guesses. Um, but what I'm doing with my puppy on free time is it's all structured, guys. There's all thing, there's all tasks that they have to do throughout it. And if I don't have those tasks, I'm probably going to get a playpen and they're going to hang out in the playpen for 30 minutes instead. But the task is I break free time up into three parts. Anyone who's been watching this knows what they are because I say it 20 times every Wednesday. Walk and play part one. 
That could be exactly what it sounds like. Five minutes of walk. Most puppies don't need much more than that unless you're, they need a lot more exercise and they're an exercise oriented breed. But if I just got a Shih Tzu, I'm doing like five minutes of walk, five minutes of play, 10 minutes of training, 10 minutes of supervised separation. The walk, play, training, that's all self-sufficient. I won't break it down for you guys. But the supervised separation, this is the one that gets forgotten most often. That's my play pen. That's my dog bed after I've already taught place and I put them on it and I tether something to their harness and something behind the dog bed opposite from where I'm sitting. So where you guys are my camera, imagine I tethered something to the bottom of the screen and my dog bed is in between us and I'm sitting here, you're holding my dog on the place while I'm sitting on the couch but I'm still only two or three feet away. I can use food to get my sit and my down but my dog can't get off a of place. And when I get some instance of settling, I'm going to take away, or I'm gonna give more space to my dog and try to go sit on the couch five feet away for the next 10 minutes. You're gonna get some pacing, your dog's gonna get off a of place, and that's okay. They can have a toy, they can have like a little bone, they can be on the bed, they can get off and lay on the floor next to it, they can lay on the bed. It's just about 10 minutes of no look, no talk, no touch, from us. It's their time to be existing on their own. Self-deficient, self-sufficient, independent. Here's the biggest one though. They're going to develop the ability to self-soothe. So what happens when your puppy's in the crate and they want to get out, they bark, right? It's because they have a lack of what? The ability to self-soothe. They can't settle themselves in the crate. You start teaching the ability to self-soothe and they start relaxing in the crate that much Quicker. 30 minutes is nothing though. Push for an hour to an hour and a half. How old is the puppy? <gasps> Hearts, you're gonna give me a puppy age. I need puppy age, guys. It helps me a lot because I'll come give you completely different advice depending on what age your puppy is. But if your puppy's four months old, I want an hour and a half starting today. If they're six months old, I want two to two, two and a half to three hours. If they're anything over that, they should be able to do four after you've implemented the schedule for a couple weeks. But if you're starting the schedule from scratch, you're still gonna get at least one hour unless your puppy barks and you let them out. Of which every time you let your puppy out, guys, what happens? And no one jump on the answer. They start learning that barking is a way of getting out of things. Demanding to be released gets acknowledged by being let out. Don't feed into it, guys. You don't need to. Sure. I think I'm pissing off a lot of positive reinforcement only trainers. Guys, we do 90% positive reinforcement, just so you know. Uh, what am I answering? How much time? Okay, thank you. Oh, Shih Tzu Paws? Mm -hmm. I was just about to answer yours. You beat me to it, girl? All right, get it. All right, Shih Tzu Paws. How much out of the crate time at, at a time should my 13-week-old get? I'm assuming it's a Shih Tzu, so small breed dog. 13 weeks old, 30 minutes max, and it might even still be a little too much. Uh, the reason being is that your puppy, most puppies out there, under four months of age should be sleeping about 18 to 20 hours a day. I know no one bite my head off. I know it's a lot. Anyone out there who's had a baby, who just gave birth, who's got a toddler that's like one or two years old. Is that toddler? I think it's toddler, right? Because they like topple around. Is that how they got the name? All right, cool. Um, baby sleep like 22 hours a day. Your puppy is a baby. They're as young as they're ever gonna be. They need more sleep now than ever before. So what happens when you have a baby? They can't just crawl around everywhere, right? They'll get hurt. So we need a nursery for them. What happens to be in a nursery, a crib? <gasps> it's almost like it's a crate in a bedroom. And they're only getting short windows of being awake because when they start getting cranky, we need to start doing things with them. I give my task of 10 minutes of walk and play, 10 minutes of training, 10 minutes of supervised separation. And after that 30 minutes, I'm just getting bit to all holy heck. See how I did that, Kimberly? I didn't cuss a single time there. I know I'm working on that this week, or at least to the end of this show in two minutes. Um, you wanna give them all these tasks and when you start getting jumped on, nipped at, bit at, pulled on by the leash, it's not because your puppy's a little jerk. Well, maybe they are, but I don't know. It's probably because they're cranky and tired and they're ready for the crate. So that's when we put them in there. We help them settle down a little bit through all those routines. There's a reason, guys, why we end free time with supervised separation. There, there's a couple of keys to those words. Supervise separate, separation. That means they're not on the couch getting cuddles because if your puppy just got a bunch of cuddles and you put them back in the crate, they're sitting there like, are you crazy? You just, get, you just loved on me for 10 minutes. I can't exist in here calmly. 
and you get the barking. Supervised separations that help the brain and body settle. So when you put them back in the crate, they can actually relax in there. Wow, I just went hard. I'm tired. Is it over? Is it 31? I'm going to go one more question just because I am kind of on a weird note there. Number two for Shih Tzu Paws. Not leaving food and water out all the time for a 13-week-old. How often would you suggest having water available at the end of every free time window? And then you might still need to get one final potty before you put them in the crate. Because 13 weeks old, guys, that's young. It's a little over three months old. Not many dogs are going to be able to hold the bladder for the full hour and a half or even an hour in the crate after 30 minutes of free time and then getting water, especially if they've been running around. Give them one final potty time. Mine's currently potty. Mine currently potties all the time due to consistent drinking all day. Do you mean like they're consistently drinking all day like free access to water? Because if that's the case, then yeah, I would, I would limit it. And again, I'll give you the measurement one more time. Half cup of, ha, half cup of water for every 30 pounds of body weight every two to three hours. Half cup, 30 pounds of body weight every two to three hours. You guys do the math. I'm not going to do it for you. All right. And then yeah, limit it. Make sure you're giving it only at the free time windows, one final potty before going back to the crate, and then you should be good. All right, I'm done. I don't have Bethany though. So, all right guys, see you next week, Wednesday. Bethany usually does the outro. See you next week, Wednesday, 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Pacific time, and we'll see you guys in a week. Thanks for tuning in to Ask a Puppy Trainer Show. We hope you found some advice that you can use to help make puppyhood a little easier. Don't forget to join us live every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time on Instagram or TikTok at The Puppy Academy. This is where you can get a chance to ask your burning questions in real time. And if you want even more puppy guidance, visit our website at thepuppyacademy.com for info on joining our online puppy school. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing to our podcast and leaving us a review. These reviews let more people find us and supports us on our mission to help as many puppy parents as possible around the globe. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.